So you saw the movie. A little movie of vibrating balls and springs inside a solid. And in fact, we have talked a little bit about the fact that in in every solid, at any temperature, these little atoms are continually in motion. They're they're vibrating and these little chemical bonds are being stretched and compressed and whatnot. And uh, and so we could think about, so if we looked inside a solid, we'd see this motion. They're not going very far from equilibrium, but they are, they are moving. And not surprisingly, the hotter the object is, the bigger the motions, the colder it is, the smaller the motions. It turns out, we'll talk about this more in a couple days, that even at absolute zero, there's still some energy in the vibration of these atoms and chemical bonds. It's called ground state zero point energy. It's, and it turns out that that be quantum, we, we learn from quantum mechanical analyses that even at absolute zero, the internal energy of a system like this is not zero. It's got some non-zero amount of energy that it can't get rid of. Um, and so there's always some energy that we call thermal energy. And not very surprisingly, the temperature and the average energy of these things is related. So more moving around, higher energy. Now we could try, in principle, to calculate the amount of internal energy in some object, solid object, some like a mouse, by finding out at some instant exactly where every atom is and exactly what its velocity is and then calculating the kinetic energy of every atom and the compression of every chemical bond and adding those up. Um, and that's not very practical. <laughs> so that's not typically the way we do it. So we turn to macroscopic measurements. Um, and so we do things like measure temperatures to determine. And, and it's going to turn out, and we'll see at the end of the course, that it's not just energy that temperature is related to, but entropy as well. But for right now, as a sort of heuristic, a rule of thumb, higher energy, higher temperature. How do we measure the temperature of something? Well, we put a thermometer in contact with it. So let's imagine taking a, a tube filled with colored alcohol or something and putting it in contact with this. So how does energy how does it measure, how does the thermometer measure the temperature of an object? Well, what happens? Here's, here's my thermometer, and it's in contact with the edge of this. How, though? How would it get to the same temperature? Transfer of energy, isn't it? So what's happening? They're actually collisions. This atom is hitting an atom in the thermometer, and now it starts to move. And through collisions between atoms at the edge of this block and atoms in the thermometer, energy is transferred from the block to the thermometer. And your, your instinct is right. In If we wait long enough, they will end up at the same temperature, and we'll talk about that. Um, but you can see why you don't want your thermometer to be really big. Because if your thermometer is really big, a lot of energy would flow into the thermometer. And then the temperature that you're measuring is actually going to be lower than it was originally because so much energy has flowed into the thermometer that your system is now colder. So you don't, you don't want that. So you need kind of a, a small thermometer. Um, but it's, it's just collisions, and energy is transferred, and that's right. And so we're interested in this kind of energy flow um, due to a difference in temperature. Um, and so we're, we're going to be – that's what we're going to be talking about today, changing the thermal energy of a system, changing the internal energy of a system by transferring energy – in or out. Okay. 
Um, so uh, going back to our potential energy curve for two atoms bonded together by a chemical bond, um, remember that we said it looked kind of like this. This potential energy curve has a name. It's called the, the Morse potential energy for Professor Morse, who's the person who figured it out. And remember that down here, near equilibrium displacement, it's nearly parabolic, so it's a good approximation just to treat this as a, as a spring here. Notice that, um, so it's a bound system, so suppose there was a value, one value of k plus u could be that, and another value of k plus u could be that, and suppose another value of k plus u could be that. Because this is an asymmetric well, if we look at this, we see that the equilibrium position is actually shifting slightly. That's an exaggeration. The equilibrium separation is a little bit larger as the energy of the system gets larger. And that corresponds to thermal expansion. Most things actually expand when they get hotter. And it's because as these atoms vibrate more, the average distance actually increases. So we want to talk about bookkeeping and how we change the, the internal energy, this what thing we're going to call thermal energy of a system. We start out being pretty empirical about it. Um, because it's so hard to do this from first principles, people have just made a lot of measurements of the properties of materials. And so people determine how much energy you have to put in to raise the temperature of a certain amount of a particular substance by a certain number of degrees. And that is called the specific heat capacity of a material. Um, and it's usually represented by a capital C. And it's defined as um, the change in thermal energy of a certain number of grams of a system whose temperature increases by a certain amount delta T, specific heat capacity. Or it has to be, you have to specify how, how, how much of your system you've got. So it's per something. It's often specified per gram. It could be per kilogram. It could be per mole. It could be per atom. But it's, it's per something. And so the change in, we can rewrite this, of the change in thermal energy of a system is going to be the mass of the system times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. Notice that this is a delta T. So as long as we're consistent, it doesn't actually matter if we use Kelvin or Celsius because one degree Celsius is the same size as one degree Kelvin. So as long as we're as long as we're consistent. So we can, it's often written as per Kelvin. So for, here's an example. Um, to raise one gram of water, um, by one degree Kelvin requires 4.2 joules. So we say that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram per Kelvin. Um, and again, you can, it can be given in different units. And so, but this is kind of a standard one. So let's just do a back of the envelope calculation to see what this would mean. We talked about changing the temperature of something by, by just contact with something at a different temperature, and that's one way. But in other words, by doing work on it. So suppose we take um, 
a jar of water that has 500 milliliters of water in it, about half a liter. Um, and we shake it back and forth vigorously 500 times. And while we're doing that, we're exerting a force of something like twice its gravity, twice its weight. Okay. So the question is, how much would a temperature go up? So we have 500 grams of water, and we're shaking it sideways, so it's going that way. We're say we're moving it a meter, and we're doing work on it. So how much work do we do? Uh, well. work by us is Fy delta Y times the number of times we do it, right? So so let's say we exert a force that's twice the gravitational force on this thing, so that would be 2 times half a kilogram because uh, a milliliter of water weighs a gram, uh, times roughly 10 newtons per kilogram. And we're moving it, so that's a force. We're moving it one meter, and we're doing it 500 times. So that's 10, 5,000 joules. Okay, so we do 5,000 joules of work on this 500 milliliters of water, half a liter of water. Yes. Well, 9.8 because we're being, it's, <laughs> there's no point in being precise since we're doing order of magnitude calculations. So rounding off to, rounding off to, to 10, okay. Um, so we do 5,000 joules of work, and so let's see what the energy principle says about this. Well, it says the change in energy of a system is work done by the surroundings. That would be us. So the change in energy of the system looks like it must be 5,000 joules, and when we're all done, and the water comes to rest, it's not sloshing around anymore. So it, its kinetic energy ends up, of the, the water as a whole, ends up being zero. So all that work must have gone into changing the thermal energy of the water, right? So we can say that this is the change in thermal energy plus the kinetic energy of the water, and we're saying that that we wait till it quiets down. So we this must have gone into changing the thermal energy of the water. So how much did the temperature change? How hot? How much hotter did it get? How do we do that? That's a delta. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're going to set that equal to the mass of the water times the specific heat capacity of the water times the change in temperature of the water, and that's going to be equal to the work done. And so we're going to solve for delta T, and that's going to be 5,000 joules divided by uh, 500 grams. And we have 4.2 joules per gram per Kelvin. And so what does that come out to? 2.3, 2.3. So after we did all that work, we shook this liter of water, this, this bottle of water we got from the, the drink machine. 
back and forth 500 times and moving in a meter, exerting a force of uh, 10 newtons. Then, uh, then we it got it should have gotten hotter by about 2.3 Kelvin, 2.3 Celsius, same thing, right? And that's about it's roughly five degrees Fahrenheit, right? It's it's about a factor of two. So we'd be able to detect that. It would definitely be warmer. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And this again, this is empirical. We look up these numbers. Okay? At the end of the semester we'll see that we can actually predict these from first principles using our ball spring model of the solid and what we know about spring stiffnesses and masses. Of, of spring stiffnesses of atomic bonds and masses, we can actually we're actually going to be able to do a calculation from first principles to predict this. But for right now, we're just using numbers we look up um, for objects like that. Okay, so so work can change uh, the thermal energy of a system. Another way to change the thermal energy of a system is just by putting it in contact with something whose temperature is different. And we were talking about that earlier. So we actually are going to change the energy principle a little bit to add something that we haven't talked about, which is a new way of getting energy from the surroundings. It's not just work done by the surroundings that changes the, therm the thermal energy of a system or the energy of a system. But we're going to talk about another mechanism, which is this energy transfer due to a temperature difference. So that we call it, it's called capital Q. And this is energy transfer due to a temperature difference between the system and the surroundings. So you put your Coke in the refrigerator, so it'll be cold. In that case, energy is flowing from the Coke into the refrigerator, thermal energy. You put your soup on the stove and on a, on a fire, and energy flows from the fire into the soup. So Q can be positive or negative. It's positive if energy flows from the surroundings to the system. That's heating your soup on the stove. It's negative if energy is flowing from the system to the surroundings, making your system colder and, and giving it less thermal energy. And so there, are, we now know two different ways to change the energy of a system. It turns out we can we can add some more things as we as we go along. We may radiation various things like that. So pot of water, kilogram of water sitting on a stove over a fire. And not only that, but you're also stirring the system with a paddle or an egg beater or something like that. There's energy transfer due to the temperature difference between the water and the fire. You're also doing work on it. So what's the increase of thermal energy of your water? Well, the answers greater than 5 are particularly interesting since there weren't any alternatives. But, um, but yes, answer 5 is correct. And it's... It just comes from this equation. So if uh, this was 5,000 joules of energy transferred from the fire to the water, because it's positive here, and there were 2,000 joules of work done by you, and this thermal energy was the only thing that changed. The pot isn't, the water isn't sailing through the room. And so, so thermal energy increased by 7,000 joules. 
And so the next question is, of course, how much did the temperature of the water increase? Now this says on a per gram basis. There's, so that means per one gram. Uh, yes, that's correct. It is 1.7 Kelvin. And how do we do that? Well, we have change in thermal energy of the system is equal to the mass times the heat capacity per whatever that mass unit is times delta T. So we have uh, delta E thermal is equal to uh, MC delta T. The unknown, of course, is delta T. So we want to delta E thermal divided by MC. And we said that was uh, 7,000 joules. And how much water did we have? We had 1,000 grams. And the heat capac specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram per Kelvin. And let's just make sure all these units come out right. We have joules canceling. We have grams canceling. We have Kelvins in the denominator of the denominator. So that's going to come out to the numerator. And... Indeed, that is going to come out to uh, delta T is 1.667 Kelvin. Okay? So not, not really all that much to it. We're just using empirical data um, relating changes in temperature to changes in internal energy. Now, this is actually something that's worth thinking about <coughs> because, uh, because of a trap that people keep falling into when they think about things. So which of the following statements <coughs> is correct? <coughs> well, you can talk to each other. Okay, you're hard to fool at the moment. Good. Um, so Q and delta E thermal are not the same thing because there are other ways to change thermal energy of the system. You just did that calculation where you, you Q is energy transfer due to a temperature difference, but you could also be doing work on the system, and the, they both contribute to the thermal energy change. They're not always equal because there can be work. Uh, even if Q is zero, you could be doing work on the system. So it's thermal energy could be changing. That's correct. And they can be both positive or negative. So okay. So, so the message is don't fall into the trap of thinking they're the same thing. Um, all right. So just for completeness, let's do a simple problem that involves uh, specific heat capacities. Um, and this idea that, that you've, you've articulated already that if you put two objects in contact with each other and you wait long enough in an insulated situation, you wait long enough, they'll come to the same temperature. Um, and that's... That's true. It's sometimes called the, the first law of thermodynamics. Thermal equilibrium will occur. Uh, things will come to the same temperature if you insulate them and leave them alone long enough. Now, it doesn't say anything about how long long enough is. There's no time in these energy energy problems. Uh, so until it happens... But consider the following thing. 
suppose we have a block of aluminum that weighs, has a mass of 300 grams, uh, and it starts out at 500 Kelvin. And we place it in contact with a block of iron, a bigger block. which is initially at 350 Kelvin. And we put this in a styrofoam enclosure, or one of these little coolers, styrofoam things, and we wait long enough. And we know that at this temperature, now it turns out specific heat capacity is not completely constant. It actually does vary somewhat with temperature, but at this temperature, the specific heat capacity of aluminum is about one joule per gram per Kelvin. And the specific heat capacity of iron is about 0 0.42 joules per gram Kelvin. Uh, so what is the final temperature of these blocks after they've sat there for a while and come to the same temperature? What is that temperature? And think about it for a minute. Think about how you do it. Talk to your neighbor and see if you can figure out how you would do this problem. And think about how you'd start from a fundamental principle. Presumably the energy principle, right? So how do we start from the energy principle to solve this problem? Okay, so what should we choose as our system to apply the energy principle to? Both blocks, okay? So let's write down the energy principle. We have change in energy of the system, which is the change in the thermal energy of the aluminum plus the change in the thermal energy of the iron. And that's equal to work done by the surroundings plus energy transferred in from the surroundings due to a temperature difference. So there's, there's our energy principle. And the system, both of them. Now, how much work is done on this system by the surroundings? Zero. And how much energy is transferred into our system from the surroundings during this period? Zero, isn't it? Because that's why we put it in an insulated enclosure so that, um, and that means that this system is what we call a closed system. There's no energy flow from the surroundings into it. Lots of systems aren't closed systems. Your, your house isn't a closed system. Uh, energy can flow in or out. Okay. Well, that's good. So the next step, it looks like the change in energy of the system is zero. And so what am I going to do? How am I going to, what am I going to do to get a temperature out of this? Okay, so we want to say that this is going to be the mass of the aluminum times the specific heat capacity of the aluminum plus delta T for the aluminum. And we want the mass of the iron plus the specific heat capacity of the iron plus the temperature change of the iron, and that's going to equal zero, and that's a problem, isn't it? Because we know the mass of the aluminum and the specific heat capacity of the aluminum, and the, but we don't know the delta Ts, and are they the same? They're not the same, are they? So we have to take another step. What's the next step here? Well, let's just write out what delta T is. This is sort of the key thing. So we have... 
this is 300. We'll just plug in what we know. 300 grams of aluminum. We've got 1.0 joule per gram Kelvin for aluminum. And we're going to write delta T, we're just going to write it out. So we're going to have, write it out as T final minus 500 Kelvin. T final for the aluminum minus 500 Kelvin. And now we're going to add the iron, 650 grams of iron. And the specific E capacity is 0 0.42 joules per gram per Kelvin. And we have T final for the iron minus 350 Kelvin, which is where we started. And what's the final thing that lets us solve it? The final temperatures are equal, aren't they? So, so this, we don't need subscripts because these final temperatures are equal. And now we have one equation and one unknown and we can solve it. And it comes out to some number, like 429 or something like that. But So there are two sort of key points. One is start from the energy principle, choose both objects as a system. The next is realizing that the system will equilibrate given enough time, and then when it finally does, the objects will be at the same temperature, same final temperatures. There's another, I'll just note briefly, there's another thing that um, it comes up in this context and it's a concept of power. Uh, we've been doing problems involving energy where we don't know anything about time. So we're just saying we wait long enough and this happens. But sometimes... Um, we're told energy input per unit time and how long it takes. And pa that's all power is. It's just energy per unit time. So it's so in SI units, it would be joules per second. And a joule per second has a name that's a watt. One watt is one joule per second, and so kilowatt is a thousand joules per second. And so, if you were told you're doing work at the rate of so many joules per second, so many watts for ten seconds, then you could calculate how much energy you'd put into a system. So that's power. Um, okay. Any. Questions about that?